it. Thanks. I'm, uh, I'm Jim English. I'm the director of the Penn Humanities Forum. Thanks for coming. Um, today's lecture is co-sponsored by the uh, Art History Department. So I want to thank Holly Pittman. I don't think Holly's here, but she's the chair of the, uh, of the Art History Department, and uh, we're grateful for her and their support. Um, we're, we're past spring break now, so that means we're now into the, uh, the final leg of the series of events on peripheries. Uh, the series is going to end on April 17th with uh, a very cool event. You will have seen some of these cycling uh, here, but I'll just mention them briefly. Uh, on April 17th, uh, that's a Wednesday here in Rainey, we have an event called Medicine at the Margins. Um, it's an event in the, the medical humanities, as we're calling them now. Um, the, uh, the focus will be on the ethical and technological and practical challenges that are faced by medical practitioners from uh, the U.S. and including from here at Penn in our, our Penn Botswana partnership uh, when they try to export their practices um, to remote, relatively remote areas, um, in particular in Africa. Uh, so we have, um, we have three um, very uh, important researchers who've done a lot of work in Africa um, on, uh, in, in medicine and healthcare, and um, uh, they'll be doing a kind of conversation with each other and with us. So that's the final event in the series. Um, we do have this Friday, two days from now, um, uh, open um, to Penn faculty and students um, a small undergraduate conference where we uh, highlight um, and celebrate the work that our own undergraduate fellows are doing um, at the forum this year. Um, that will be upstairs in the, in the Neville Room uh, all day on Friday. And even if you um, just have a chance to stop in briefly for a talk or two or a panel, uh, the uh, students are always happy to see faculty and fellow students there. Um, finally, I'll mention one other event, which is not in the periphery series, but it could be since it's all about mapping and uh, spatial relationships. That's next Friday, the 29th of March. Uh, it's unusual for us. It's a Friday event, and it's a morning event from 9 to noon. Um, and uh, we will be looking at some of the new technologies of visualization and mapping that have uh, entered into the humanistic disciplines now, this, the, the, the digital humanities. And mapping and visualization uh, is really the most um, discussed and exciting area in the digital humanities. Um, so there'll be a lot of show and tell. We'll be learning some of the new um, ways of, uh, of, of visually rendering uh, cultural, historical information. Um, all three of our participants in that event, they are technically um, uh, advancing these, um, uh, the, these, these new tools, but they also have all worked extensively in Chinese history and culture. So they'll be showing us in particular um, new mappings of uh, information about China, past and present. I think it'll be very cool. Um, it's, uh, that's Friday the 29th, three hours, 9 to 12. We're not going to go nonstop three hours. Uh, there will be a coffee break. There will be nice refreshments. I don't think I've gone three hours, three morning hours without coffee and since, since I was 15. So um, that's not going to happen. Um, okay, as for the format today, we're going to follow our usual pattern, which is that at the end of the lecture proper, we'll take just a one or two minute break so that those who can't stay for Q&A um, can, uh, can make a graceful exit. But then we will have a half an hour or so for conversation uh, with uh, Professor uh, uh, Chattopadhyay. Um, to do the introduction, I'm going to turn things over to the director of the Peripheries uh, series, my friend, my colleague, Kevin Platt. Um, Kevin is the professor of Slavic Languages and Literatures. He is the uh, Edmund and Louise Kahn Professor of the Humanities. He's the chair of the program in Comparative Literature and Literary Theory and probably has other titles as well, which I won't bother to list. So, Kevin? All right. Um, thanks, Jim. Um, so, thanks for coming tonight. Uh, Shadi Chattopadhyay is a professor and chair of the Department of History of Art and Architecture uh, at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, she is an architect, although she hasn't practiced for a while, she tells me, um, an architectural, architectural historian and the recipient of many awards, including a National Science Foundation grant, grants from the 
American Institute of Indian Studies, a J. Paul Getty Fellowship, a fellowship from the Swedish, Swedish Collegium for Advanced Study, the Society of Architectural Historians Founders Award, and many other honors. Uh, she is the author of many articles and two books, most recently, Unlearning the City, Infrastructure in a New Optical Field, uh, which came out of the University of Minnesota Press just last year. Um, now, as many of you know, our public lectures this year have dealt with the concept of peripheries in a variety of keys, um, in terms of the farthest extremes in time and the galactic distances of the physical universe, um, in terms of perception and vision, with regard to the literary representation of distant societies and cultures. Um, today's speaker returns us to certain of the more uh, literal uh, meanings of the term peripheries, having to do with the organization of space. Uh, Professor Chattapada works on the structure of cities, suburbs, exurbs, and other modes of spatial organization of our built environments, uh, taken in the context of even broader categories um, of the organization of territory, region, nation, uh, and even empire. Much of her work has been devoted to the study of South Asian cases, yet her studies fruitfully link together the local questions of particular locations with the problems of modern organization of human space across the, across the globe. Um, yet it would be inac inaccurate to characterize this work purely in categories of space. For Professor Chattopadhyay's writings are as much about the ideas and visions that animate human built environments as they are about the physical environments themselves. As she wrote in the introduction of her book, Representing Calcutta, Modernity, Nationalism, and the Colonial Uncanny, her goal is to bring together questions relating to image, imagination, and the production of subjectivity with those of physical space, of urban form, claim, and territoriality. Space, as we learn in her works, is always about other things as well. It's about gender, class, political affiliation, or economic aspiration. Today, Professor Chattopati will speak to us on the, t the topic of urban itineraries and peripheral spaces. Please join me in welcoming her to the Penn Humanities Forum. I want to thank Jim and Kevin for inviting me to the Penn Humanities Forum. This is a privilege. And I also want to thank Jennifer and Sarah for um, all the troubles they've taken to arrange my trip. Um, I will be talking about built space, but I want to begin with a story. And there are, you know, all these anecdotes are kind of annoying, but I want you to bear with me a little this one. This is a, at least 15 years ago. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, and uh, I'm just out of grad school in a very polite dinner event. And I was asked, is there any architecture in Calcutta? And a sassy, you know, fresh out of grad school, young faculty, I felt like saying, no, they all live in caves. But I was raised by a Victorian mother. Good form, always good form. So I swallowed that answer and tried to explain in as patient way as possible what, um, what constitutes the built environment in Calcutta. And as our conversation went along, I realized that there is really no way of convincing this person that there is architecture in Calcutta because his lens is very different than the one I am using. What he really wants to, wanted to know was, are there works by famous architects? Yes, but would, you, would he recognize them? Are there works of historical importance? Yes, but are they historically important to him? These are the questions, of course, I have been grappling with um, all through my um, graduate life and um, uh, work as a faculty. So I, and they are actually fundamental to what I do in terms of my work, because the question of peripherality that that gentleman had raised is constitutive to what I study, because I study colonialism and the politics of colonialism that denied vast majorities of population basic rights. And my goal is to connect those questions of rights to physical space. 
In the colonial cities I study, the term is used to signify spaces that are subjected to the economic, political, and cultural forces of the colonizer or the dominant power. This is the history of colonial cities within the world systems model. This is the history of colonial cities uh, which limits our conceptual horizons. Indeed, I would argue that we do not have a vocabulary to describe these cities, and I'm talking about colonial and ex-colonial cities, which is cities in most of the world. If we wish to use the term periphery productively, it needs to be reinvested with new meaning and allied with new metaphors. So now, the term has lots of connotations, and you know what I call, a, it, come with, it comes with a flock of companions, all of which suggest a lack of importance. First is a matter of scale. We talk of you know, minor arts, minor literature, or micro-histories. Then there's an issue of location, you know, the most commonly used one, not in relation to the core. It suggests marginal um, populations, outsiders. It is in terms of power when we speak of the disenfranchised and subjugated. Works that are unauthorized, peoples who are silenced. It is also a question of duration, things which are not permanent, they're ephemeral, contingent. And just to uh, anticipate my uh, discussion later, I'll be using this as one of my uh, key ways of understanding what peripheral conditions mean. But they also refer to status. The most um, uh, common term used in political theory, I would say, is not so much marginal or oppressed, but it is subaltern, which is an always in relation to or distance from the dominant or the elite. The subaltern is marked by a distance from the elite. It is also a question of visibility. And of course, this one is right into what we as architectural historians, art historians, have to deal with. If something is so-called hidden, submerged, subterranean, what is the logic through which it is made visible? The periphery does not register in the dominant culture. By definition, periphery is beyond the central optical field. This is the core definition. It doesn't matter which way you're using the term. It also suggests that it is beyond representation. It is not something that is representable. There is no easy access to the object, which is our peoples or the region, which is peripheral, which does not require some kind of translation work, if you will, some kind of theoretical in. What I find useful in the term periphery is that it brings the material and the architectural together with the political and social. If we are truly invested in a democratic world, we must find a way of bringing the physical and spatial in conversation with questions of representation. That is, who gets to represent and how. To say something is peripheral is to adopt the dominant position by default. When we see a space or a region as peripheral, we are witnessing or participating in the process of marginalization. And by the same token, using the dominant vocabulary to, that produces the conditions of peripherality. The question is, how do we do otherwise? What are our strategies of reading or seeing so that we do not succumb to the old and tired modes of thinking about dominance and dependence? If peripheries lie just beyond our central optical field, under what conditions do the peripheral spaces enter our field of vision? Which is, how do they become legible, recognizable? And what patterns do they reveal when they do? I should emphasize that it's not the physical characteristics of something that makes something peripheral. It is the lens through which we see it. It is the framework we use to see it. 
An important strategy for negotiating ascribed peripheral location is to manipulate the spatial parameters. And although I'll be talking about urban space, I want to give you a literary example, something that I trust you will recognize. Here, Joyce brings the, rhetor uh, the spatial through the rhetorical. You may recall Stephen Dedalus reading the flyleaf of his geography. The structure tells us something. Here, the territorial entities are the markers of an expansive universe centered in the self. This reflexive location of the self gets reframed when Fleming rewrites Stephen's geos. In Fleming's redescription, the nation appears salient as the mediator that would allow Stephen passage from his ascribed place to the heaven of universal expectation. That is, the different geographies of St Stephen and Fleming are animated by different frameworks that provide internal coherence to these worlds. Stephen's conception of the self is nested in concentric rings of particularities, whereas Fleming's insertion of the nation allows an immediate, literally without mediation, transferal to the universal. The self, when refracted through the lens of the nation, enables a different world of connections to emerge. Stephen and Fleming's childhood aside, nationalism's success as a political concept resides in enabling a different kind of spatial claim, as it did for many of colonized populations during the 19th and 20th centuries. The power of nationalism, which is apart from ideology and political practice, resided in the possibilities it opened up for new self-descriptions. With this, I want to propose a tour that will take us to two sets of spaces, from the scale of the residence to the scale of the street. I will argue that the moment when these self-descriptions touch the popular, popular politics, popular literature, popular art, the peripheral enters our field of vision. My first example it might not seem peripheral at all, and by many counts, it is not peripheral. It is, after all, a mansion of the Tagore family in Calcutta. It's centered around a huge public courtyard. And let me find my pointer. It was built by um, Darkanath Tagore in 1780, um, sorry, Darkanath Tagore's grandfather in 1784. And in 1823, he added another building to it, which was the sort of the outer house. So the mansion is really composed of three sets of buildings. When we look at the maps of Calcutta, I'm starting with 18th century maps, the front of the first maps that were done. All of this area of the northern part of the city, inhabited by Indians, was simply hatched in. There's only one house that is marked there. And that, with some difficulty, you may recognize it's there. That's the palace of the Shobhavaja Rajbari, which one of the most you know, wealthy landlords and, of course, um, very close to the colonial elite. What was marked out here was the British colonial settlement. The, the, this is the initial area of the settlement. That's the administrative area. OK. Thanks, David. That's better, David? Good. So, so I'm talking about the house there, which you, you know, bury. In, even in the, under the best lighting conditions, you wouldn't be able to see it, really. Now, this is a map done a few years later, 1794. And there was unhappiness about this map, even among British circles, saying that, you know, it's really not useful because it's just, you know, it doesn't show enough details. This one tried to do details, but look at the bottom here, if you can see it from where you're sitting, there are actually individual houses marked out. Whereas here, 
very few of those are marked out. That still is there. And along this, this is actually one of the main arteries, a very old, you know, this is a 17th century road, really. And here, there were some names that were beginning to show up in the early 19th century map. This is the road I'm talking about. However, the Tagore mansion does not get a reference, despite the fact that they were extremely powerful and wealthy landlords, and also merchant entrepreneurs. Not until the late 19th century, I would say second, um, third quarter of the 19th century, do we see the mansion finding a space location in the physical map of the city. And this one I drew out of the turn of the 20th century, done in the 1890s, early um, 1910s, smart plans. And the whole ensemble, this is the oldest part. This house was built later, then added on. And this one was the later edition. And I'll walk you through these spaces. So let's start with actually the newest one. This one was built by Rabindranath Tagore, the poet novelist, as a meeting house and a space of performance. So it's, you know, it's an only partial sort of residential characteristic. And what you see here, that's that building. So this is the oldest part of the complex, which has been added on for over years, and it's, it's, a, it's really kind of a um, complex arrangement. But it is organized around courtyards. This is the big outer courtyard, and these are the inner courtyards. And a clear distinction is made between the outer space and the inner space here. And you're looking at the entry here. That's the entry. So once you enter here, and that's the entry looking out from the courtyard, that's the central courtyard. That's the public courtyard. This, would be, this space would be used for ritual performances. That's the plan of the house. So if you're talking about this public courtyard, this is the entry, this is the public courtyard. This space is the space of ritual uh, performances. And this, all of this is the inner compartments. So if you're looking at this here, the public courtyard, this space called the Dalan, it's actually puja, that is you know, ritual worship. Um, initially, the Tagore family were Hindus, then they converted to um, monotheistic Brahmanism, which meant that the Puja Dalan was redone in terms of its architectural details. What is interesting is that there are two parts, of, there are two sides of this Dalan. This one, you're looking at here, that door, this connects to the outer area. This one on the other side, and that's that, connects to the inner compartments, which is the women of the household in the 19th century who were not supposed to be appearing in public during festivities could actually witness what's happening through this um, window-like gridded space. The rest of the building is a complex net of passages, corridors, courtyards, and the inner courtyard, and you're looking at this one here, is architecturally, in terms of its details, in terms of its uh, refinement, is entirely different from the outer public courtyard, which is this one. In other words, a different sort of level of embellishment was reserved for outer courtyards. It is a public courtyard and... Interestingly, two verandas in these houses that occupy major importance in telling the story of this household. Just because the house does not show up in maps until about 50 years after it was its construction is, of course, not to say we do not have any other sources to construct a history of these residences. But in these, only the public courtyard and the verandas get all the attention. And the other veranda is this one, which is the, this is the building that was built last. This is the original building, additions later. And this is the well-known south veranda, because it faced south. It's 
at, at some level, these you know, verandas were ordinary, if not peripheral, in terms of their location and use. They were what I would call adjunct spaces that accommodated a large range of activities between work and leisure. In this house, these spaces gathered significance because they became associated with the names. And the names are, for the previous one, it is Rabinath Tagore's, Rabinath Tagore's own rooms were right there, looking at that veranda there. And this one to do with Abhinendranath Tagore, the painter, his older brother, Gogonendranath Tagore, um, painter as well, and the third brother, Shamarendranath Tagore. The South Veranda was literally written into the history of Bengali culture through memoirs because it is this, in this South Veranda that the artist brothers practiced, if you will. It has become something of a legend in Tagore hagiography. It has been actually described as the birthplace of the Bengal School of Art. There was a separate dedicated studio and library for the three brothers adjoining the veranda, but they seem to have spent a significant part of their daily lives drawing, writing, reading, and conversing in this veranda. Just to give you a sense of what their works were, were like, this is Gognat Tagore's, um, he, he dabbled in, you know, his style was very eclectic, he dabbled in cubism, and uh, his probably, I would say, the best work is caricature. And Gognat Tagore, deeply nationalist, they, um, even those which were not explicitly nationalist had nationalist content. This one is one of his most well-known ones done for the Indian National Congress. And this one is uh, actually um, remembering his own mother. Sort of a, um, and if you look at the stylistic um, approach here, very carefully recuperating Mughal and Persian traditions of painting. He all, always worked in small format as um, sort of as a gesture towards um, uh, putting in place a particular kind of practice that did not require vast easels, big uh, frames, and something that actually worked nicely with where they worked. So this is the, in plan, this is the South Veranda. And this is the partition here. The three brothers would basically sit here and they would be visited by friends, students, and this partition sort of guarded the entry to the inner compartments. As should be very obvious, this house, and also the other one, had plenty of verandas. This is the south veranda, this is the north veranda. In other words, this is, you're looking at this, the, the second floor version of this, and this is this. It is evident from Abunnath's own memoirs that he painted in many different spaces during his life, in this house, and also in the Government School of Art, and so on and so forth. The prominence of the second floor veranda in these recollections thus alerts us to an idealism of open discourse that it exuded. As Abunnath's and Gaganendranath's reputation as artists grew in the first two decades of the 20th century, substantially supported by the colonial elite, the veranda acquired exceptional significance as a social space. Its rise to prominence as a figure of space has something to do with its spatial definition. It is located in the back. This one, um, this veranda actually faces this, this garden. This is, that's the front of the house. And it allowed visual and oral connection with the garden, neighborhood, and the street beyond, which is this way. It was also what architects would call an unprogrammed space, dimensionally generous and capacious enough to accommodate a range of activities. As a space in between, it was meant to forge connections. Abhinendranath, however, when telling the story of his artistic inspiration, emphasized not the South Veranda, but all those spaces in the inner compartments of the house in which the servants and women of the household carried on their everyday tasks. He viewed the labyrinthine spaces inside the house as a microcosm of the city itself, 
he called them back alleys. And though I have marked here for you the part of the inner compartments which were added on to this house, this was the original house. The plan really doesn't you know, give you a sense of the complexity of the space. If you, however, look at how many staircases are there, you will get a sense of the level changes this part you know, um, uh, encompasses. It is very complex. And sort of the earlier images of the uh, number six um, house that I showed you, this is number five, um, should give you a sense of the uh, back alley effect of the inner compartments. The ordinariness that holds the city's secrets harbors variety and thus becomes an endless font of stories is what Obunnath wanted to highlight in these um, descriptions of the um, inner compartments. In his memoirs, we see the peripheral spaces of the house and the peripheral people assigned the central role in enabling his stories. He used the phrase na dakha, not seen, literally not seen, to refer to the servants. And yet the servants introduced him to the world inside and outside the house, and they populate his stories and paintings. I'll discuss one uh, of his watercolors, um, something that he did. He did a series of um, paintings from the Arabian Nights series in the early 1930s. In this one, however, he introduced the house, their own house, and the memories of the house, stories he has heard from the house. This is the hunchback story, which, if you remember, uh, it's one of the sort of the main stories of the Arabian Nights. And um, the hunchback, the tailor brings the hunchback, um, Taylor and his wife brings the hunchback um, uh, to feast. He chokes on a fishbone, dies, and he's um, dropped off the uh, doorstep of a Jewish doctor, and then who thinks he has killed him. And everybody thinks they've killed him. And... Uh, leaves him to the controller of the sultan's kitchen. Um, and he thinks, uh, he beats the guy, thinks, um, you know, beats the corpse and thinks he's, uh, he's killed him, drops him off in the bazaar um, alley, and uh, a Christian um, uh, who uh, finds him thinks, him is, uh, thinks he's a thief and um, is, again, hits him and gets caught by the police. So they're hauled to the court, to the king's court to explain themselves. This, the symbolism, and this, this is a, it's, a, it's a rich story, and it's a, one of those stories which are recursive. The stories are embedded within other stories, and they produce more stories. What is interesting for us here is that, and this is maybe hard for you to see, this is the Kar company. This is the company that uh, his uh, great-grandfather, Darkanath, founded. Um, and all of these spaces, this is the space of the upper floor, the topmost floor, and here is the artist himself. You can't quite see this, but these are actually British um, visitors um, at his table. They're all these spaces have sort of the complexities, trying to com convey the complexity of the house as a complexity of the city. Of course, it's all these uh, characters have been translated to you know, 19th century Calcutta, 19th, early 20th century Calcutta, you have the sewing machine, you have all, uh, you know, clocks, and you have, um, in other words, moving the Arabian Nights to a different space, the space of the city that he wanted to recuperate. It helps us to know that what he was doing here was not simply inserting his own house in the Arabian Nights, the popular um, story of the Arabian Nights, uh, the house was about to be demolished, and the plans were already sort of in place by the 1930s, and it would be demolished by um, the early 1940s. What he's doing here is playing with both space and time. He used the term ontor drishti, insight, to describe the creative process entailed in these redescriptions. The insight works in two senses, the ability to see what is implicit, imminent, and not visible to casual eye, and as a gaze turned inwards from the space of publicity to the domain of creativity. Avanath used the insight to illuminate the mundane, everyday materiality of the city, and thereby building a set of relations that will give permanence to a disappearing landscape. 
Obernath was using popular literature as a vehicle to bring prominence to his vision of the city and his own familial location within it. If this is an instance of claiming cultural autonomy by redescribing spaces in the periphery, reconnecting them with spaces in the center, it is also a process of the artist setting his characters to tell their stories, an artist who relish, relishes the authorial role to set the stage, establish the connections, and edit where necessary. What we have here are subtle subversions that speak of a discomfort with one's cultural and social milieu, and not so subtle critique of the colonial city's public sphere. Aubameyang had a distaste for public performance and public appearance, and he criticized the modern colonial institutions, museums, universities, and art schools, even the one that he was head of, for, for um, proposing modern forms of getting together in public, which, as far as he was concerned, inhibited creativity. The nationalist construction of the city, Aubameyang would argue, required redefining the city's spaces through a much more complicated and subversive spatial imagination. It also helps us to know that this is in the 1930s. The nationalist movement is at its height in the, national, in the 1930s. So he has that vision of the city where the nationalists are, through terrorist movement, trying to reframe the city. Nationalism in India and elsewhere offered, offered opportunities for self-description to a small class. Most of the population remained outside its hegemonic scope, economically, politically, culturally, and I would add, spatially. An effect of these uh, and these forms of disenfranchisement we find in the proliferation of peripheral spaces in contemporary cities. And these spaces are not physically remote. They're everywhere, interspersed with spaces of privilege. This is the realm of what is often called the informal economy, the spaces occupied by petty businesses, including food stalls, auto mechanic shops, hawkers and performers along the main arteries, and bus terminuses. I'm going to show you a set of images from the collection of Chitrabani. This is an organization formed in the 1970s to document um, the city and uh, make it easier for uh, photographers and filmmakers to uh, produce films. This is an extremely variegated matrix in which one inhabits and cultivates the unauthorized. In the eyes of planners in the state, these are encroachments on proper space, proper public space, ones that threaten the social and political order of public space. 20th century modernist cities were supposed to be governed by the laws of the automobile. This implies that a certain relationship between street form and uh, width is worked out in advance, taking the standard automobile as the module of measurement. In modern planning, a distinction is made between vehicular roads and pedestrian paths. Vehicular streets are supposed to be arteries of movement and not supposed to cater to other uses. Sidewalks are supposed to remain free from encroachment for, for people and not supposed to be filled in with shops and shanties. In other words, each object, each space, is supposed to carry only one set of predetermined meaning. Most Indian cities is supposed, um, are officially planned in most cases, like Calcutta reconfigured, to cater to such modernist um, visions of economy and efficiency. Such planning intentions, however, are disobeyed, disregarded, or illegally augmented on a regular basis. Multiple uses of public space, streets, sidewalks, street ledge, and even the wall along the edge, along, a vehicular, along vehicular arteries, is a common occurrence in these cities. What, like this one, it involves revealing multiple meanings that these forms potentially harbor. The typist here is using the window ledge as a desk, um, which has, you know, that has just the optimal dimension. The narrowness of the sidewalk, it's completely insufficient for a public walkway, 
offers a platform for the chair and doesn't leave more space than that. The type is temporary claim to space between the building and the sidewalks is presumably premised on the windows of the building remaining closed. I mean, you couldn't, it, this couldn't take place if the windows were actually open. In other instance, a puppeteer claims a part of the sidewalk by positioning the puppets along the crack on the pavement to construct a rectangular slice of performance space. The claim will leave no trace on the sidewalk, save the extant suggestive fissure. The small boy here, looking at the space, has made the connection between the space as given and the contingent possibilities inaugurated by the puppeteer. He has made what I would call ephemerality concrete. One of the few Indian architects who have tried to accommodate this unauthorized uses of public space in design is Charles Korea. In the, in the early 1980s, Korea made a simple but elegant proposal that drew upon his spatial reading of the illegal occupation of sidewalk in Mumbai. At the time, it was still Bombay. If streets and sidewalks are indeed places where people live, why do not we make them habitable in a more meaningful sense, without denying the idea that these are also paths of vehicular movement? So this is what he's suggesting. In, you know, instead of having a road um, bed like that and narrow arcade here, he's merely suggesting let's put a platform here with, with a wash tap, which can be used for washing and, um, um, and space for hawkers. And at night can be used as a platform for sleeping. Needless, needless to say, this was not put in place. What interests me is Korea's method here. He's trying to clearly render functional separation as a matter of time, as a function of time. He's looking to plan events while accommodating the fungibility of space. That space is, you know, it has multiple meanings. Yet he wants to avoid contingency as much as possible. You know, as little conflicting uses as possible. Contingency is essential for our understanding of our urban marginality in contention with the dominant framework of the city. How space and power are negotiated by people who find themselves marginalized in the city. To explain what I mean by the importance of contingency, I want to turn to a form of art that most will not consider art at all. I call it vehicular art, in the absence of a better term. These are paintings and graphics on privately operated public buses in Calcutta and trucks. I'm going to talk about the ones in buses because they are very different from the ones in the truck that you see here. I'm going to talk, going to talk about this stuff, in the backs of buses. But I have to tell you a story of how I got into it, because I've been seeing these since my childhood. It was a very hot summer day. I was late for an appointment. I'm in a car, chauffeur-driven car. I'm stuck in traffic, and this is what I see. It is written on the back of one of the buses. Literally translated, I'm standing because I intend to go. It means it's an absurd causal inference. You know, it doesn't make sense. It made me smile, though. The reason is because I caught what it was referring to, which is a famous Bengali line of a, uh, of a Bengali poem by Shrukti Chattopadha, one of the modernist Bengali poets. Jete pari kintu kano jabo, I can, but why should I? In Shrukti's verse, It's a refusal to accept the dictates of modernity. Refusal to move out without choosing to do so. I will go, but not yet. I will take you along. I will not leave my, myself untimely. This is also a promise that will not be kept. The writing on the bus is both a sort of a commonplace address to drivers and passengers, but
but it's also what I would uh, call a brilliant exposition of the contradiction of modernity. What has happened to these buses in the last, actually, um, I would say 10 years, is that they used to come in bright colors. They have been repainted. They have, it's been uh, legislated, basically, that the State Transport Authority expects buses to, be, to have a yellow stripe and a blue body, which takes out all the sort of the colorfulness, the glitter, all the um, decorative effects, or much of it. What it's trying to do is produce a seamless continuity when it is clearly made out of panels, aluminum panels, bolted together, basically, bolted against the frame. These buses are not done in an assembly line. Only the machine comes from the factory, and they are handcrafted in hundreds of garages. They're called garages in the suburbs of Calcutta and in um, sort of the extended region of Calcutta, the extended suburbs. They, are, they all look like ad hoc spaces, found spaces, though they are actually quite organized. It is a, the vehicular art itself is characterized by sort of profusion of text. But before I go to that, I should point out that the handcraftedness of it allows things like fixing this little panel instead of having to move, you know, um, replace this entire panel. So it's very useful, very practical in terms of how it's built. It's, a wooden, it's built around a wooden frame, this whole body. And inside you, can, you get to see the wooden frame. There's a profusion of texts, and there are all sorts of funny and interesting things happening here. And I will discuss a few uh, later, but there are a few that are, you will see repeated, the Indian flag, some kind of you know, line here, and it could be anything. I mean, the range is vast. There's always um, something like you know, the stop sign, something called danger, and you'll see interesting spellings of that, and painted stuff. Now, Coca, um, the bus owners, uh, artists and operators, are a varied, you know, extremely wide range of, come from an extremely wide range of socioeconomic groups. And this is the um, bus drivers um, and conductors cooperative. Should give you a sense of the extremely small means. These ha people actually have at least a high school education, most have a high school education. They're extremely well organized. They have their own cooperatives. Many of them are um, part of a union. And this is the building where the cooperative that I um, um, studied, if you will, had long conversations with, was held. This is both a club and a cooperative. It's sort of a microcredit organization, but it's, just, it's much more complicated than a microcredit organization. And they, and I wanted to know what the stuff mean. What did they think about it? And they pretty much told me, oh, you go and figure it out. Let me tell you how our politics works. So I kind of tried to figure it out. So I'll tell you what I think is happening here, how to read these things. The question I'm posing is not... Um, what the provenance of this art necessarily. I'm asking, what does the bus art do? Well, how does it perform? Seeking possibilities of reading vehicular art within the urban milieu. There are two shared aspects, the playfulness of the textual assemblage and the spatial strategy of putting the parts together. Vehicular art is performative. It shouts out warnings, conveys messages, recites tradition, literary, and otherwise. It is also ephemeral. It is painted over every few years. If it, is not cultural, if it, is, if it has not culturally reg registered, it is because it offers a problem of recognition. 
The design motifs consist of floral patterns, national landscapes, images of gods and goddesses, and topical images such as World Cup soccer or the destruction of the Twin Towers, that are, or the World Trade Center. The most common image is a mask-like monster face, the one that you see here. An unpropitious image, it is meant to ward of the evil eye. The sign and object compel you to see, but suggest that you look away. Of course, the problem is, how do you make sense of the line from Tagore next to that? These images are juxtaposed next to quotations from poems, religious philosophy, mandatory messages prescribed by the State Transport Authority, uh, things like, uh, there's often um, a speed limit mentioned. Thematically, they range from what I would call the frivolous to the maudlin. They could be seriously political, like remember Cargill was very important at one time, but there's also don't kiss my tail. So, I mean, the, the range is, uh, I mean, the, there's no way I can give you a comprehensive account of the range. It's vast. But there are also, this one tries to do what I call the popular existentialism. And here you see the, you know, the danger sign, you know, nicely and incorrectly uh, misspelled. Because here the English language has become sort of part of a common parcel. It's almost not used as a language, I say. It's almost used like an object like. And some of these warnings um, and sayings are used in multiple languages. The one I like probably the most, this was inside the bust, it said, beware of pickpocket, and next to it, God is everywhere. <laughs> A significantly large number of texts comment on the importance attributed to mobility in modern capitalism, efficient management of time, quick transportation, quest for upward social mobility, and passage between city and country. They're split between advocating the value of time, punctuality, hard work, and efficiency, and serving as critiques of the same values, of an unquestioning desire for better, faster, richer. Many are direct critiques of state ideology that glorify the nation. This one is in um, response to the, you know, when I, I've been looking at this for a long time, and when I first saw My India is Great, I thought, oh, people are just genuinely patriotic, only to recognize, no, the Regional Transport Authority mandates that. And it just was started from 1975 with Indira Gandhi imposing emergency on the country and insisting on efficient mobility, fast production, and all the good things of civil life. The uniqueness and the significance of this plebeian artwork is that it borrows equally from a craft tradition, both rural and urban, and a bourgeois literary tradition, and infuses these with new images and events to create a realm of popular existentialism, advocating ways of negotiating and dwelling in modernity. Two primary sources, one you've already seen, is Rabindranath Tagore's poetry, and the other one is the sayings of the Bengali saint, Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. This is a text from Ramakrishna. The former is the hallmark of Bengali high literature with its refined language and gesture towards a universal humanism. The latter consists of a philosophical praxis fashioned from the everyday speech of the Bengali peasantry one that is radically opposed to Western nationalism. Rabindranath's poetry was nurtured within the confines of one of the wealthiest families in Calcutta, the one that you, I showed earlier. Ramakrishna was a poor, illiterate man from rural Bengal who ceaselessly impressed upon his middle-class disciples the need for detachment from worldly desires and from the bondage of service in the colonial economy. Vehicular art speaks both to its own constituency and to the middle class, sharing a common vocabulary, implying a closing of distance. The more elaborate texts, for example this one, are after all only available to those who read the language with some refinement. You have to understand the literary illusion, illusions, otherwise you will get some meaning and not others. I want to do a little sort of spatial analysis of this. 
here you have you know, all sorts of you know, you know, dis seemingly disparate things happening. So here, here you have the stop sign license, but these are always there. Mind is great you know, sometimes with a flag or without a flag, it's always there. It is also an advertisement. And here comes the main panel, which it's, by the time I took the photograph, it wasn't very clear. So it could be war um, in Kashmir or Afghanistan. And then, of course, instead of the monster face, you have naked male figures urinating. So what do you make sense of it in terms of commentary about public space, about war, about mandated um, slogans? We could think of it as bricolage, which is the art of making do, producing objects from diverse materials. What this does, this does is takes objects from one context and, of course, puts it in another context. According to Claude Lévi-Strauss, bricolage involved creating structures out of events or from the remains of events. He called it fossilized evidence of the history of an individual or society. Event or contingency rules over structure or necessity. Incidentally, Lévi-Strauss also claimed that too much contingency would destroy the sense of a work as art. The bus artists, I'm sure, not that they care about bricolage, would defy or ignore those aesthetic calculations. Bus art, however, deals with both objects and concepts. It has an uncanny similarity with bricolage in that it treats the words concepts as if they are objects that can be cut and pasted and juxtaposed against a range of other heterogeneous images, objects, and signs as a mode of changing the structure of meaning. This is the last example I'm going to show you. This is the one that I recall from the emergency days. The slogan, Nation is on the Move, was prescribed by the state authorities to suggest that suspension of civil liberties was actually lifting the nation out of stagnation, increasing productivity, and facilitating progress. However, its location next to the usual stop warning and above the sign from Jadavpur to Bibliwak to locations, made the mandatory message completely trivial, showing up its ridiculous claim. This reading, however, is utterly contingent. The power of the text and the delight of the reader resides in this contingency. In the process of creating a structure of meaning, it highlights the blank spaces between the words opening up a whole range of other possibilities. This manner of creating structures depends on the articulation of the background as a productive space of reading. The possibilities are not infinite. This art of putting together word signs, however, creates structures only through a proliferation of events. The structure, and that's why it's sort of hard to read these things, gets buried in the play of contingencies. A spatial organization that facilitates the multiplication of contingencies as opposed to abating contingency and appears unstructured and incoherent is mirrored across a wider domain of everyday practice for marginalized groups in the city. Such practices bear traces of a long history of dislocation, of having to rely on minimal resources, of finding devious means to access the dominant space and political structure. It invites creativity, the ability to forge connections, not all of which is resistive, and much of it comprises mundane acts of survival that disappear without a trace. Only when read through a particular alignment of contingencies, they can create trouble. Only within certain conjunctures of text, visual space, and viewer does the structure emerge and achieves the power of the popular. Thank you.